Good morning. Um, it is uh, March 24th, the first Tuesday of our online experience. Um, I confess that it's been a bit of a shock for me. I'm sure it's been a bit of a shock for some of you. I've, uh, I'm here at Houghton, but I'm in my house. Um, my library is up on campus and uh, it's been frustrating to prepare and not to be able to pull the books I want off of the shelf. I have a few books, so the lecture is a little less connected than I would like, but I think it's important to just get moving and get things perfect. It's probably true for all of us. The song for today is uh, Psalm 117, and I'll read it and we'll start talking about um, evangelicalism and its impact on the modern world. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people. For his merciful kindness is evermore more toward us. The truth of the Lord endureth forever and ever. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Um, so today what I want to do is uh, talk to you about evangelicalism. Um, the rough trajectory for this week is to have uh, first this kind of, I, I present the kind of ideas about Evangelical revivalism is one of the forces that's made the modern world. Um, I'm going to have you do a, a homework assignment afterward in which you compare some of the religious ideas of the evangelicals, <clears throat> specifically Edwards and Wesley, with Voltaire as a, a leading kind of uh, Enlightenment skeptic. Um, then on Wednesday, I, I hope to post an introduction to Equiano who is a representative of, of kind of African identity in the modern world, um, and also of evangelical identity, kind of brings these two things together. And then what I'd like you to do is read Equiano, and on Thursday at our last time, we'll have a Zoom session, we'll have a little bit of a chance to dialogue, um, and we'll um, talk about Equiano, and we'll also talk about the second exam which will be due next week as a take home. If you've got questions, we'll talk about it in class on, on Thursday, but if you um, have questions, you can always email me. Um, I'm generally gonna be available by email at 10 o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, oh, no, no, that's not true. Um, <laughs> my, yeah, my, my time is gonna be um, right after our normal time. So at 2.30 on Tuesday and Thursday, um, and then at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. Um, and if you need me to set up a Zoom session, I can. I'd be happy to talk that way. Um, I also have Marco Polo on my phone, so you can download the app and uh, contact me that way. So let me share my screen, and then I want to talk about um, evangelicalism. And um, the, the, um, I'd like to start with a discussion of John Wesley. Um, John, John Wesley was the um, son of an Anglican pastor and a dissenting mother. Dissenting sort of means in the British context in the, in the tradition of John Bunyan. Um, if you look there at the map, you can see the rough division of Europe in religious terms when um, John Wesley was a child. Um, the majority of Southern Europe remains Catholic. So Portugal, Spain, France, and the Italian provinces, and about half of Germany. Germany and the areas to the north become Lutheran. Um, Calvin, it's Geneva in Switzerland, and then sort of in Holland and in Scotland become Calvinist. But Calvinism is also very influential in England, where it had influenced the Puritans, and in America, where Puritans come for refuge. And then finally, you see sort of this Anglican halfway house in England proper, but because the British Empire comes to control so much of the world, Anglicanism sort of gives us the Episcopalian church that we have today and um, Anglicanism in its various forms around the world. Now there's a, there's a fourth kind of variety of Protestantism, the Anabaptists, which are not all that dominant in any one place, but have pockets of influence in Germany and they come to be really influential in Pennsylvania in America, where they sort of form the, um, the progenitors of the Amish and Mennonite tradition. Um, so th those are the sort of major varieties of, of Protestantism at the time of Wesley. Um, Wesley himself was deeply influenced um, by his Anglican father, 
um, who was a royalist and a supporter of the crown, and his uh, devout nonconformist or dissenting mother, Susanna. Um, his family was really strong-minded. Um, his father had actually been imprisoned at earlier in his life for his sharp attacks on the dissenters. Um, John Wesley's described as hard driving, but also sensitive, intense yet patient, detached yet charming, self-disciplined yet intensely emotional, opinionated yet curious, open to counsel yet impervious to pressure, brusque with bad faith yet also tolerant of contrary opinions. This is this is Wesley, um, and Wesley is, I, tells a story of him as a young boy. Um, in, in 1709, um, the, the rectory sort of catches on fire where he was. Um, and he's very dramatically saved from, from, his, from the house. Um, he sort of develops this idea that then he's been saved for a special purpose, that God has a reason that he survived the fire and he's preparing him for something. Um, Wesley, like many uh, Anglicans of his, uh, Anglican preacher's kids anyway, of his day was terribly well-educated. Um, he's sent on a scholarship to the Chapter House in London, uh, a church school where he learned Latin and Greek, um, and which then allows him to go to Christ College, Oxford in 1720. Oxford's in decline, but it still has the old kind of greatness. Um, he gets a first class education. He's very well read. Um, and in, in the years between 1725 and 28, he sort of has this um, encounter with, with God. He begins to take the idea of religious orders more seriously. He begins to fast. Um, he becomes good friends with a slightly older student named George Whitfield, and together they form a holy club, um, which their, their, their schoolmates kind of detest because they seem like they've become really focused on the rules. And most people go to Oxford in these days because they, wanna, they want the sort of party school experience. They want the gentleman's finishing. Um, where they, they, they hang out with their friends and they make all these connections and they're not so much interested in piety. Um, so with, with George Whitfield and his brother Charles, they form this small group focused on the common life. They take frequent communion, they study the ancient fathers, especially the ancient desert, desert fathers. Um, and they um, strenuously, strenuously pursue piety. Um, now his family wants him to go back to the parish church where he was raised at Epworth and follow his father into the ministry, but he doesn't want to give up this cloistered life with his friends. Um, so when his father dies in 1735, um, rather than do what the family expects him, to do, um, he accepts a missionary call to the American colonies and um, allows this Anglican group what's called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to send him to Georgia. Um, now, in route to Georgia, his life has changed when he meets this group of German Lutheran pietists called Moravians. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Moravians. Um, the Moravians are an older group than Wesley. Um, their, their key influence comes from uh, Philip Jakob Spencer, whose dates are 1635 to 1701. Um, and in, in 1675, he writes a, um, a book called the P.A. Desirata, um, which emphasizes the Lutheran idea of the priesthood of all believers, um, their centrality of pious and holy living rather than just having orthodox doctrine. Um, the, the, the Moravians believed that God would make those who followed him holy, not just to make them right before God, so that to heaven, but that they could have what, what John Wesley would later call them sanctification, that they can actually live holy lives. And as part of that holiness, these Moravians were on the way to America to become missionaries to the Native Americans. Um, and um, they, the, the, the Moravians actually had a fair amount of success with this. The first missionaries, like in Greenland or in India, are actually Moravians. Um, and so what Wesley is really impressed by the piety of the Moravians. He sort of has gotten a position on the ship going to America as the chaplain of the vessel. And he's supposed to be praying for the salvation of all of the sailors. I um, mean, he realized that he's primarily concerned about his own sin, skin, sorry. Um, and that the, the Moravians are actually, they're singing hymns, they're calm, 
peaceful, they're not afraid of the storms. Um, and this really challenges Wesley. Um, it provokes some ideas in his um, doctrinal development. Um, he gets to, he gets to um, Georgia, discovers that he likes the Moravians' boldness and wants to try to emulate that. Um, he begins to experiment there with some of the uh, liturgical ideas that he has. Um, he got from Oxford about um, maybe baptism by immersion or using some ancient prayer forms as part of the vocal common prayer. But, but generally speaking, uh, Wesleyan scholars think that Wesley's mission to Georgia was just a complete and utter disaster. Um, Charles has been appointed as, his brother Charles has been appointed as the secretary to the governor. And he's, so he's got good work. Um, but John falls madly and hopelessly in love with a rich young woman named Sophie Hopland, who is the niece of, niece of the bailiff of Georgia who keeps the prisons. Now, Sophie is really not interested in this earnest young man. She doesn't share his affections. Um, Wesley is torn between his, his ardent love for her and his sense that this isn't what a good Christian young man ought to do. So he, he kind of alternates between rebuffing her and then telling her how much he loves her. Um, so she's not impressed and she elopes with a rival and gets married so that she doesn't have to deal with John. John behaves very selfishly. He's furious. He bars her from Holy Communion. So then her husband sues him for defamation and his, the people in Georgia sort of challenge his reforms. They don't like the, the newer things that he's doing. Um, so Wesley actually sneaks out of Georgia as a failed missionary on the sly and goes back to England with his tail between his legs. Um, not exactly what we expect from the, the founder of Methodism and the Wesleyan. And when he's, when he, when he's um, back in London, um, he has this experience that, that I had you read in his uh, journal, right? So this is from the um, 1738, when he's fellowshipping with a group of Moravians at Aldersgate Street. And he describes himself as having this religious experience and he describes it in terms of feeling. Um, he says now, um, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistles of the Romans. And this is a Moravian Bible study. Um, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin. Yeah. And so what, what Wesley kind of experiences here becomes a core part of what we would today call the evangelical experience. Um, he moves from kind of a faith in faith itself to uh, um, real possession of faith, that, that God loves him and that God has saved him, and he doesn't need to be afraid. So he moves from wanting to be saved to actually assurance that God has saved him. And he's so impressed by this, as, as you read in the journal piece, that he then visits the Moravians in Germany for three months, were impressed by their piety. He decides he doesn't like the cult of personality that surrounds the major Moravian fellow by the name of Count Bloomfield. Um, which, so he doesn't, later on in his life, he doesn't talk much about this connection. But in the journal, you can see that this is a major part of his formation. And then um, in 1739, word arrives from, I'm going to jump ahead to a different part of the story. Um, no, sorry, a glitch, yeah. Um, about something that's happening in America to a fellow named Jonathan Edwards. Um, so I want to tell you the Edwards part of the story and the way that Edwards kind of shapes him as the rise of Edwards. Um, now in America at this point in time, like in England, there's an established church. An established church is a church where the government, um, in his case in Massachusetts, but there are also established churches in New York and in Maryland and Virginia and in almost all the colonies, except maybe in Pennsylvania, where the Quakers didn't believe in established church. So you paid tithes um, to support the church and everyone who lived in town had to support the church. If you didn't go to church, you could be arrested by a local official and sent to jail. Um, the local universities were all sort of church-based. So in Massachusetts, you had um, Harvard, which is supported by the government in, in Connecticut, to Yale, which is supported by the government with their seminaries. And so what we think of today as a separation of church and state is really a, a piece of the enlightenment. It's an idea that's sort of come down through us from Jefferson and Voltaire, and in part from the evangelicals, as we'll talk about. 
So um, Edwards um, was the descendant of uh, a very famous and powerful um, Puritan pastor named Solomon Stoddard. Solomon Stoddard had been the, um, the leader in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, where he pastored his entire life. His grandson, Jonathan, had gone off to uh, Yale, gotten a degree there, and had come back. And Edwards sort of begins a, a new style of preaching. Edwards is really influenced by Locke and Lockean psychology, and in particular, this idea that um, the, the senses that we have are what we perceive shape us and shape who we are. And so Edwards wants to be really attentive to the way in which the pastor could, could use the sermon and use the ideas that are presented to sort of shape the mind of the listener and to kind of help them get into a place where they might have a conversion experience. Not that the minister could sort of force people to be saved or that people could even sort of force themselves to be saved. Edwards is a Calvinist who believes that God chooses following that the pastor could maybe help things along. Um, so Edwards um, writes this, um, so th th there, there are a series of revivals that take place in um, Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, the, 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 the sermon that's been most famous from this series is a sermon he preached called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, where Edwards sort of describes how um, your soul is suspended over this pit of hell and that God, you're dangling by a thread and he tries to create in the reader, the, the, in the listener, this sort of sense of fear and terror. Um, the, the fact is, this is actually a really uncharacteristic um, Edward sermon. Most of his sermons are less about feeling, more about kind of theological sharpness. Um, but Edward's sermon... Um, and in fact, that sermon produce, produces such a sharp reaction that um, he stops giving it. It's, it's really not, doesn't accurately characterize his, his work. You get a better sense of his work actually from the, from the piece I had that you read. So he, he publishes a, uh, an account of his revival called uh, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God. So the, the faithful narrative describes how God works in the hearts of people. And you get another, another take on this key evangelical idea of conversion, right? So Edwards is describing this four-year-old girl named Phoebe Bartlett, who in the midst of the revival um, is sort of drawn into faith in God. Um, and th this is a strange choice of conversion narratives, in part because good Calvinists believed that a four-year-old girl was younger than the age of accountability. They couldn't possibly have the reason necessary to become a Christian. So they tended to focus on teenagers as like the prime space in which you needed to get your life together. The age that you're at as college students would have been sort of the prime field that Edwards was focused on in terms of bringing people into the church. He wouldn't have thought of her as saved. Um, just didn't understand, right? But you see in the story how this 11 year old boy is really internalizing his sense of sin and how he needs to know that he's in need of salvation. And so he teaches his sister and the sister then is sort of completely overwhelmed because she knows that she's a sinner and she can have a simple faith in God and that she's prepared to go to heaven when she dies. And this is a kind of a shock to Edwards um, because it ought not be, and it maybe really is a sign that God is doing something surprising. So this, this book is really a, um, it's an interesting text because it's a, as a re set of re revival accounts, it takes what was really just a local revival in one small town of probably less than 2,000 people in Northampton, Massachusetts, with a local pastor who really, really would spend almost his whole life pastoring there which was typical of a parish pastor in these days. Um, and Edwards writes this account and it goes off to London where it gets published in 1707. And, but then in this new age of sort of um, print and um, this network of dissenting and Anglican pastors read it. And so Wesley's in England and he reads it and Whitfield's in, Whitfield's in England and he reads it. And these pastors begin to think, 
maybe we could have a similar revival here where we are. And so the, 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 the first great awakening begins to spread modeled on Edward's revival, but it spreads all over the Atlantic world and it becomes this sort of transatlantic event. Transatlantic meaning it spreads around the periphery of the Atlantic Ocean. It's in London, it's in Scotland, it's in Wales, it's in Georgia, it's in Massachusetts. Um, it's also in the Atlantic world where the, one of the figures that we'll read about um, next, Equiano experiences. It. So this, this sense of revival then is picked up by Whitfield. And Whitfield is, a, is another interesting character. So Whitfield is a friend of Wesley's. He's been a pastor um, in the Anglican church ordained after his experience at Oxford. Um, Whitfield is theologically closer to Edwards. They're both Calvinist. Um, Wesley's gonna develop uh, kind of West uh, the Methodist church and an Arminian theological church. And more on that for the of theology. Um, so Whitfield then goes on a preaching tour of the America, right? So between 1739 and 1741, he goes on this tour where he goes from Maine all the way down to Georgia. I um, mean, he preaches this kind of simple conversion gospel that you're a sinner, that you're in need of regeneration, that God is reaching out to you. But part of what makes Whit Whitfield so striking isn't just that he preaches and that he preaches revival, which is a fairly new thing but the way that he preaches. And you can sort of catch, a, catch an, a, a glimpse of that there in the painting, right? He has his hands reached out and he's preaching over people. And he, he had um, theater experience before he decided that he wanted to become a pastor. And he really felt that God called him out of the theater, which he saw like the Puritans as a, a vanity fair sort of unwholesome place. But that he still could use these gifts. And so he used to act out Bible stories on stage he would have a staple of 30 or 40 sermons that he would kind of go to depending on the course. So he'd come into town, preach four or five sermons that he'd never published. And this was a spectacle unlike anything that anyone in America or really England had ever seen. I mean, it was sort of, it brought the gospel into the masses. Now, the, the, the year that immediately surrounds this is a year of sharp economic downturn in England. There's a major economic crash in 1739. So no matter where he goes to preach, um, the people turn out, and a lot of scholars actually think that this set of revivals is core to kind of making modern England what it is. It helps to create a modern England that where the, the working classes respond to this message and they become motivated by this doctrine. This becomes a key part of evangelical, this idea of activism, that when you're saved, you're not just saved for this life, for the next life, but you're saved for this life, and God wants you to get into the business of developing a whole life. And so as people respond to Whitfield's sermon, they begin to think about how they might be discipled and how they could turn away from, just like Bunyan had, turn away from the sin in his life and develop kind of a holy, sober life. Um, major scholars of kind of English industrialism and capitalism, um, E.P. Tompkins, a major Marxist figure, or uh, Ely Halevi, um, is a major French historian of, of, of the British kind of capital. They both say that this, this moment sort of helps to make England and the Anglo-American world what it is, where the American and Anglo-English middle class really become much more intensely Christian than say the working classes of France or other parts of like of the world are. Um, they're, they're less influenced by skepticism. And so this is, I would argue, a key part of the enlightenment that we're gonna be talking about. That, that in England and America, people begin to focus on morality and self-improvement kind of as the fruit of a conversion, right? Um, but but um, when Whitfield and Wesley speak, you would get, you might get 20 or 30,000 people show up, they would be motivated, they would be, they would be, and they both generate a fair amount of controversy. Um, Wesley and Whitfield both teach that the church should be taught by pastors who, um, I mean, they want them to have formal qualifications, they want them to be educated, but that the preacher should themselves be converted, and that they should themselves be a Christian, um, and that the main reason that the churches in America and England are dead is because they've been you know, preached to by dead people, right? Um, and in England, this was considered really dangerous because there was an established church that provided unity for the realm and unity for the state. 
And to teach against the church in this way was to teach against the realm. Um, so so um, Wesley and Whitfield are at pains to kind of be Anglican and to remain Anglican, right? But many people who decide that they they're gonna follow in their footsteps, this is not an important thing, right? So there are this new group of Presbyterians that emerge of the old Scottish church in both America and in Scotland, who insist that they're gonna form a, a church of the converted. Um, so in America, Gilbert Tennant um, becomes a evangelical preacher preaching this conversion experience and preaching the necessity of holiness. Um, and when the church in um, Scotland doesn't like what he's doing, he decides he's gonna form his own institutions, he's gonna train his own pastors, and he founds Princeton Seminary as a way to kind of spread this approach. Um, so what does this mean for America. We've talked about Wesley and the spread of a Wesleyan set of revivalism in England. I know we've talked about how there are these forces for it in America. Well, in England. So what this is a peculiar to the formation of America, right? If you look at this map here, you can see the um, the space around which um, revivals are going to happen. And because America was settled by different refugees from different colonies, you can see here. So this is where the Puritans had settled. And there had been, um, the, the Baptists aren't there yet, right? There has been a, a small Dutch presence here, but a heavy German settlement in the middle colonies because the Quakers had allowed anyone who was a Protestant or Catholic to come, right? The South is Anglican. You see this intense religious diversity in the middle colonies, really unlike anything in the Western world, except maybe in Holland. And into this environment comes um, Whitfield, who in, a lot of scholars think actually, I mean, he doesn't invent the Great Awakening. He takes what was a local revival right here in central Massachusetts and makes it into a, an Atlantic phenomenon. Wesley does this, but Wesley's preaching mostly in England. He doesn't have as much success in America, right? So what is this Great Awakening? Well, it's a set of um, renewals. It's a set of spiritual renewals that emphasizes the what scholars have since said are the core kind of four the four core doctrines of evangelism, right? So the first thing they emphasize is the primacy of scripture. Um, this is a thing they share with most Protestants. It's not, it's not unique to them. The second is a high emphasis on the cross and the idea that, that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Again, this is core to um, Protestantism, to Catholicism too, but this doesn't have a sense of penance as a part of faith that you get sort of have a sense of a, uh, the third thing, which is a conversion experience. You need to turn from death to life, that this event ought to be fairly discreet, that it's individually chosen. Um, it's God's choice, the Calvinists would say. Wesley would say, no, we have free will. We get to make the choice. Um, and so the tension between those two ideas sort of creates this division, this competition within evangelicalism that I think helps it to thrive even more. And then fourth, this sense of activism, that, that being an evangelical means that you ought to want to make the world a better place, right? And if you think about Houghton, Houghton really is a place that's inspired by these four kind of tenets. You, you see this in chapel, you see this in sort of Houghton's desire to go out and make a difference in the world. So we talked about where it happens. It, the where is a transatlantic set of revivals, meaning it happens all around the periphery of the Atlantic world. And it really happens because there's this sense of that the old church has become decayed and decadent. So this, this might surprise you. Enlightenment skepticism of folks like Voltaire and this, the criticism of people like Whitfield Edwards and Wesley, they share a sense that the establishment is broken and needs to change. And so this is, you know, you would think that the intense piety of a Wesley and the, the skepticism of Voltaire would mean that they're at war with one another. But in fact, on the ground, many of them, they see themselves as allies against a powerful established church, with bishops and a structure of taxation. And they both kind of see themselves as, as common cause. See, there's, a, there's a great example of how this works in America, a strange alliance between uh, George Whitfield, this evangelical revival preacher, and the skeptical kind of scientifically minded Franklin, who was a deist. He believed that God had created the world, but that he kind of walked away and he wasn't all that engaged in it, right? 
But Franklin loves these sermons. He loved these sermons because he's, you know, at Whitfield is teaching the people to go and do good. He's raising money for this orphanage that he's founded, the poor children of Georgia. And Franklin actually donates large sums of money to the orphanage. He does a lot of good for Whitfield. Whitfield benefits so much in, from Franklin because Franklin's profession is a printer. And as a printer, um, Franklin is really interested in the revivals and he puffs them up and he tells lots of stories about them. And in particular, he publicizes the controversy over theology, over the established church, over whether pastors ought to in fact have had this conversion experience. Um, and he uses the controversy to sell lots of newspapers. In fact, if you look at kind of the lists of pamphlets and print, things that are printed in America between about 1740 and 1760, um, the majority of them are on this religious controversy. It makes a lot of time, a lot of money for the planners. And historians have actually suggested that this might this might teach people how to have kind of a fight. This is in some ways the secret of its success. Um, it generates a lot of controversy, and, and Americans then are confronted with this: the idea, like, I need to make a choice. Um, I need to kind of. I'm confronted with this preacher. He's telling me I need to either have this experience or don't. I perceive that I have this need. I have this need for regeneration. Um, I ha you know, and th there's this belief that God will maybe do something in my heart, and the means is going to be the means of the Holy Spirit that's working in me. Now, th this, um, this actually creates, in my mind, th this, this really does help to kind of intensify um, the idea of the modern self that the self is a person, that we make individual choices that we're driven by our conscience, and that we get to kind of direct how we're going to make our lives happen. Um, think about religious choices that you would have, right? If you were Dutch and you grew up in New York City, um, you really didn't get to make a religious choice. There's a Dutch Reformed church that you're supposed to go to, and your parents would have been baptized in it, and your grandparents, and that's where you've lived your whole life, right? And yes, there are Presbyterian churches, but the Scots go to the Presbyterian churches, and the Germans go to the Lutheran churches, and the Amish go to their churches. And like, there's this sense in which you don't really get to make choice. And now all of a sudden, you're being confronted with choice. You know, there's going to be a Presbyterian church that's established and has an Edinburgh educated pastor. It's probably going to be um, the traditional Presbyterian church. And then there's going to be one of these new pastors um, in town who's trained at Princeton. And you have to make this choice about, do you want to be an evangelical Presbyterian or traditionalist Presbyterian? And um, that idea of religious choice, I think, is, is a core part in England and America of equipping people for even democracy, right? So. How does this change, especially America, but also to some extent in, in Europe? Um, this religious diversity leads to an explosion of new denominations. There are new Congregationalists, there's the emergence of the Baptists, there are the Methodists, there are new Presbyterians. There are some tensions within the Lutheran community, and with that come the creation of these new seminaries, especially Princeton, but also Andover, as places where people are going to learn and be catechized. Um, you also see, and this might be a word you've never seen before, I want you to wrestle with it a little bit, the trifurcation of belief, right? So people are forced in this environment into kind of making a choice between three different options. The new light option was the term for evangelicalism, so it's the way of Whitfield, Edwards, and Wesley, right? You choose to have faith that centers around word, cross, conversion, some kind of activism, making the world a better place. Or you can choose the old, the established church. You can be a traditionalist Anglican. Many of those churches are, or, you know, or Presbyterian or Reformed. Most of those churches are defined by a creed or a confession or a liturgical service or a, um, you know, a book of common prayer like this, where you're going to worship in this way, and that's going to be what makes you a particular kind of Christian, right? And into this environment springs Voltaire, right? So Voltaire is looking at this battle between the two. He's sharply critical of the religious establishment. And what he's doing is he's suggesting that perhaps um, Christianity is superstitious. He looks at history. Um, he he um, 
Note, note how he thinks Christianity is a, is a principal source of violence in the world, that it's created more war, um, and that he, he's, he really has it in for Christianity. He, he in particular thinks that, you know, maybe Buddhism or maybe Zoroastrianism or these other faiths are, are less, um, less prone to warfare. I'm not sure if, uh, in fact, I, I know that, that that's not necessarily true. Um, but but um, so you, you have a choice. You know, you can be like Edwards and choose this new light, or you can be like Franklin and choose the Enlightenment skepticism. But at least in America, the new lights and the Enlightenment secularists join forces to fight for the separation of church and state, right? That each of them wanted religion to be free from establishment and um, at least when when America is founded that's a key part of the revolutionary victory so you see enlightenment secularists like maybe Thomas Jefferson supporting it but then you also see these Rhode Island Baptists um, in the tradition of independence and you know Bible and faith believing that they also ought to be free from any kind of establishment um, this also helps to kind of intensify this vibrant middle class print culture. That's an important part of the Enlightenment in France, right? Um, but it, it takes a different form in England and America. So that the, in England, when you're reading to sort of try to make yourself a better person, and you might read Locke, you might be interested in French philosophy, but the, the, the path of moral improvement in England and America is less kind of a rebellion against the Catholic Church and state authority, and really a place where you have your own agency. And so Americans didn't feel like they needed to channel their religiosity. You know, they, they, when we finally had an American revolution, it was less a revolution against religion and more a revolution where our own religious identity enabled us to take on the Anglican Church. So this is a, this is a core part of understanding why two paths of modernity, why the French go in a radical direction, they're following Voltaire. And in England and America, it's sort of the, the revolutionary tradition is with the Puritans. It's religion against the monarchy rather than a, re a revolution against church and state. So, all right, that's a lot of what I hope to accomplish um, in the, the lecture today. Um, depending on um, which course ends up watching this lecture. I intend to use it for both the humanities class and maybe East meets West. You'll go in different directions. So um, follow the syllabus and you'll have all specific questions for me based on what's next. So, thanks very much.